And it's really nice to see so many people here again to watch this kind of esoteric little talk that I'm going to have. Though, I should warn you all, though, this is going to be a mostly technical talk. As such, I'm afraid that the supply of neat renders, I mean, images, is actually going to run a bit sparse at times. But I hope you will all learn something from all of this, at least. First, though, I did notice that there is a minor misprint in the pamphlet, in the schedule pamphlet. This talk is intended as a 15-minute talk. So if you intend to also catch the talks at 16.30, you should know that I will run over that particular time point, at least. So be ready for that. And interestingly enough, something similar actually happened to me last year as well, since this is actually my second year of presenting here at BlenderCon. Still, I think some kind of self-introduction is probably in order. My name is Gustav Wallemarsson, a software engineer at ARM, where I typically help out with various bits and bobs of the Mali graphics driver stack, and particularly the parts related to hardware ray tracing. And to top it all off, I'm also a so-called industrial PhD student at Lund University in Sweden, where I also work with various ray tracing related topics, some of which may make a small appearance later on in this talk. All that said though, I am obliged to say that I do not represent ARM during this event, nor is the content herein sponsored by them, so any views or opinions I express are entirely my own. And just in case you're wondering, I'm also not affiliated with the people behind PBRT in any way. I also happen to have used that framework quite a bit over the last few years. But with that, let us jump into the meat of things. In this talk, I will primarily discuss three things. PBRT, the rendering framework and subsequent file format, how to create custom importers in Blender, and how to create custom exporters. I will also briefly touch upon some aspects about custom renderers, but more on that in a little bit. First though, I hope I haven't lured anyone here with hopes about learning about PBR, PBR textures and techniques. While the letters are the same and actually stands for exactly the same thing, that is going to be an entirely different topic, which is out of scope from this talk. First, though, let us briefly summarize what we already have in Blender in terms of rendering engines. By default, we have Cycles, the unidirectional volumetric path tracer that we typically use to create our nicer images, and EV, the real-time raster-based engine that we use for a bit faster rendering, and of course, the workbench renderer which we typically only use for previewing our models inside of Blender. And I must say, not being a Blender developer, I don't really know a lot about the internals of these renderers, but from what I've been able to gather so far, both here at BlenderCon and elsewhere, they do appear to be very flexible and featureful renderers. One could also argue that some features of these, such as view layers with clever compositioning, makes these counts as multiple different rendering engines. Still, sometimes it is desirable to use something different, something which may be more suited for some specialized task. And this is kind of where PBRT comes in. In full, this stands for physically based rendering from theory to implementation. And it is both an award-winning textbook and a research and educational framework for developing new or improving existing rendering algorithms. It is also open sourced under a very liberal license, and as such, it has been very influential over the last few decades. And in the last two editions, have even been made freely available online, which you can find through these links, making them an excellent resource for learning about all things rendering both theory and how to implement them. As for the renders that already exist in PBRT, they are plentiful, to say the least, as I hope these lists kind of illustrate, even if they are a bit disingenuous. As I said before, with the compositioning, we can easily get some things, such as ambient occlusion rendering, in cycles and EV, 
Here, though, that would correspond to an entirely different renderer. Note, though, that this is in part a research framework. As such, the additions have consequently followed various trends in computer graphics research, hence this varying availability of rendering algorithms over the years. And just to show you an example, this is one such case where it makes sense to have such a specialized renderer. As scenes with a lot of caustics like this is still something that is ex extremely challenging to render. To the left, yes, from your point of view as well, I rendered this caustic heavy example scene with a stochastic progressive photon mapping algorithm uh, renderer in PBRT. And to the right, I did my best to try to recreate the same kind of caustics in cycles. But even after digging through lots of rendering settings, I just didn't really manage to get anything, as I hope you can see there. Although I fully expect that someone who knows cycles a lot better than I do could do a lot better job with this than I did. Still, the fact remains that if you know what your scene is going to contain, it sometimes makes sense to choose a renderer that is more suited for that particular task. But, as I said, PBRT is also an ideal framework for developing new rendering algorithms. So, way back when, in 2019, HBO aired their excellent Chernobyl miniseries. And in the first few episodes, some eerie lighting effects were attributed attributed to this thing called Cherenkov radiation, which happened to catch my interest. So I did a little bit of research on that particular topic. Typically, it is a phenomenon that can be seen in the proximity of active nuclear reactors, as you can see from these photographs. But when I looked for some, let's say, neater renderings of the effect in a more controlled setting, I wasn't really able to find much. And this video simulating a single particle in 2D, a single charged particle in 2D, was among the few things I found, showing how photons are emitted in a cone from the path of a charged particle. And while it is neat and describes the phenomenon quite well, it's not exactly the neat looking rendering that I was after. So that got me thinking could I modify the photon mapping algorithm that I showed you before to somehow generate something similar, but in 3D and with accurate lighting? So to that end, I created a simple variation of the so-called Cornell box, like this, letting a charged particle enter the scene along the red arrow, passing through a kind of sphere, which is sort of like gonna be a resistance for the particle, which then should in theory cast light in a cone like this. And after a little bit of implementation and experimentation in my homegrown renderer, I got something that looked something like this. Doesn't look like much, but it was a good proof of concept that this might actually work. So after a little bit of porting work to PBRT instead, I was able to get a lot of features almost for free which gave me a rendering that looked something like this, which is much better than anything that I could easily create in my own experimental framework. Basically, in PBRT, I got a lot of these extra features for free, such as accurate handling of spectral properties, which are really necessary to sell an effect like this, at least if you want it to be physically based, at least. And, this phenomenon depends quite a lot on the density of the material that the particle passes through. So, to see how that would affect things, we created another scene with rods of vary varying index of refraction, giving us a rendering that looks something like this. And this, and a few other things, we wrote up in a paper that I created a number of years ago. So, if you're interested, you can find the details down here, or on my personal webpage, along with the code that I used to create these. But with that, I hope I've given you a sufficient introduction to the motivation for why we may want to use a different framework, either to improve some specific effects, such as photon mapping, or to make it easier to try things out in a different 
kind of research framework. Now, though, it is high time to start talking about how we can use Blender to help with this matter by creating an importer to get things into it and then an exporter to move Blender objects to our renderer of choice. So today, in keeping with the BlenderCon theme this year, we are taking the first steps in making Blender love PBRT. So I want to start with talking about the importer, since it's sometimes desirable to be backwards compatible, to some degree at least. And thus, being able to import existing scenes that you have created directly into Blender could be a huge boon. Furthermore, for PBRT in particular, it is rumored that it has been used as the base for creating various production renderers. Lux Core Renderer, or just Lux Renderer, was one such renderer at one point in time. So getting some of those scenes into Blender for comparison could be very interesting. But first though, just so we're all on the same page, let us take a look at the format of a PBRT file that we're going to be working with. In short, it is separated in two parts. This first top portion, before the world begins, up here, describe how we want to render an image, setting various parameters about how the output image should be stored, where the camera should be located, and so forth. After that, we describe the contents of the scene, or the world itself, placing light sources and objects with the help of various transform directives, as well as dressing them up with materials. And it is also possible to include other files, very similar to what we do in C and C++. And those files may also be compressed using gzip compression as you can probably see from the file extension of the last file down there, thus keeping the files small while still keeping, uh, giving us a textual, textual representation that we can work with. And these individual files simply contain more statements of the same kind, as you can see here from this, this description of a base plane mesh and a slightly transformed red sphere. And once you run a scene like this through PBRT, you get an image that looks something like this up in the corner. Nothing too exciting, but a good starting point to get an idea of what the format looks like. And to my knowledge at least, there is no existing PBRT importer for Blender out there, but there are a few libraries out there for parsing the formats which kind of makes sense. As I saw before, it's not really a difficult format to work with. So I wouldn't even be surprised if there are quite a number of in-house parsers already out there. It probably would be possible to use these libraries with Blender in some fashion, but doing so, I hope you can see, will complicate matters quite a bit since that means we would have to somehow integrate third-party binary libraries in some way into our extension or add-on, which felt quite tough to do, just look, starting to look into extensions, and would also make for a quite different talk here. So in here, at this presentation, everything will just be done in plain Python. This obviously means that we probably won't win any performance drag races, but for what is probably only going to be a single one-time cost for importing files into Blender for working with, being more general and more portable feels like the right choice. As I mentioned though, I have used PBRT quite a bit over the last few years and I even used this with my own in-house PBRT parser to generate a bunch of test data by first converting the PBRT format to this GLTF format instead. That's kind of what I talked about last year and then I used their importer instead to bring that file into Blender. This works, but it's a bit problematic for a few reasons. Firstly, PBRT has quite a number of primitives to, to describe objects, most of which are not supported by GLTF. But most crucially, while GLTF has a great material model, 
The one available in PBRT is substantially deeper with a full graph to describe mixing of both materials and textures. As such, in my converter, I was forced to adjust all materials or simply drop all of that information. Luckily though, for my earlier projects, I was only interested in ambient occlusion rendering. So I didn't really care about losing all of that material information. However, going forward, that is something that I'm going to need. Hence all of this effort. And obviously though, it should be possible to add quite a bit of this as custom extensions, custom GLTF extensions. But as there's so many things to add, going that particular route felt like the wrong thing to do. So starting from the basics felt like an easier approach. So what do we actually need to do then from Blender's point of view? In short, we only have to create a so-called operator. That is something Blender can identify as modifying something in the scene. And of course, there are various flavors of these, but we want to create import and export operators. Kind of makes sense. But for convenience, we probably also want to add a few extra things, such as a panel for modifying various properties about the import process, and probably a menu entry for starting the process from the user interface. So starting with the mandatory, to create an import operator, we need to create a class that inherits from the Blender operator class. And in our case, we also want to inherit from this import helper class, since that will add a couple of conveniences, such as helping us with a file importing process or a file picking process rather. And as with a lot of Blender classes, we need to set various configuration variables and properties for this to function properly. In this case, I would say that the more important ones are these. The ID name that gives the operator a function to be called by, and the files property, which will contain the files that are going to be imported when the operator actually runs. Any other properties that you would like, such as which parsing mode that you want to have, such as, such as which version of PBRT that I'm currently working with, can then also be added here. As for the panel, we kind of have two options. We can either directly create the draw, a draw method in this operator class like this, or we could create an entirely separate class to specify how and where that class should be placed. And doing it like this, do, creating this method would then give you a panel in the file picker, as you can see up in the corner, that can contain all ex any extra options that, might, you might want, that you might want to have, such as the mode that I mentioned earlier. And of course, creating a panel class would give you a bit more control, as, I shown, as is shown here with the export operator, although it is a little bit redundant in this case. As far as I understand it, the current default place is to place the panel in the file picker. So this example simple places the panel in its default place. But sometimes you want to have the options to control this. So this option is there for you. And as for the menu entry, that is actually one of the easiest things to add. When registering the extension, we simply append an operator to this Blender object, which is then called when we actually call that choose in menu entry. So even if the text is a little bit small, I hope you can see the highlighted entry that adds a new file extension that you can actually work with. So moving on into the actual importer infrastructure that I call it. And here I will start to dig a little bit into the files themselves. And for that, I typically break this process into a couple of steps. So the first thing we want to do is actually simply ask Blender to start the process by implementing that execute function that I left open before. Here, we do run into a little bit of a caveat. Blender will behave slightly differently depending if you select a single file or whether you select multiple files in your file picker. So for a single file, the full path ends up in the file path uh, property Otherwise, the base name for each file that was selected ends up in the files property list. 
In our case, though, you typically only want to go through each of these that have been selected and then call the same parsing method for each of them. In this case, I call that function unit import. So for that singular import method, it really only does two things. Parse the file and create Blender objects from some kind of intermediate representation that it gets back from the parser. I did, however, find that it was really useful to create a catch-all exception handler here. Since parsing files is a very error-prone process, so typically Blender will always catch stray exceptions to avoid crashing the interface, but somehow I always kept losing the full stack trace, which is obviously very useful when you're debugging code. So adding this traceback call here can actually print it out for you before handing it over to Blender, which may be very useful for debugging things. So with this, we are actually inside the parsing infrastructure, starting with the tokenizer that basically groups together characters to form singular strings that we actually need to, that we actually need to interpret in some kind of way. And typically, I wouldn't really go into details about the parsing stuff like this, but I am particularly happy about how easy Python makes things like this. You really only need five lines to get a full, to get a complete tokenizer for the PBRT format, depending, of course, how many lines you intend to count this as. Some might count this as a single line for all that I may care. And this includes a lot of things, such as finding the correct place where in the file that you're parsing an error actually occurs, as well as having support for adding sub-files to the token stream, which, of course, we need for, to handle the include statements that I showed you before in the example file. And this is, of course, powered by the built-in Python module, the shell lexer, or the schlex model, which is typically used for parsing command line arguments but it also works really well for more generalized parsing tasks. Then from these tokens, the parser builds an intermediate representation. Although I hope I will not disappoint you all too much as I will omit basically everything about this parser itself. Suffice to say that is, that is not a lot more than a bunch of functions with a lot of if else statements to handle all possible tokens and states that can be encountered when you're parsing a file. In total, this is around 600 lines of Python, which isn't too bad for a parser that is able to parse all example files for, for given by PBRT for all editions of PBRT, as well as the very complex Moana Island scene that Disney has given out. Even if you would need lots of memory to actually contain the intermediate representation for that scene, I need around 64 gigs just to contain it. So when the parser is done, this intermediate representation looks something like this. Higher level things, such as rendering parameters, are gathered in this settings dictionary, and world objects themselves are collected in another dictionary, separating out shapes, instances, lights, materials, and any other scene-specific object. And the last thing we need to do, then, is simply convert this representation to Blender objects. And that is what happens in the actual importer part, as I call it. And that part is not particularly fancy. It simply applies the appropriate rendering and camera properties, then simply loops over each of the quantities that, we, that should be converted to PBRT objects to Blender objects. And just to show an example, when I import a single shape, I typically do it like this. In short, I create a mapping over all shapes currently supported by the importer, and then call a dedicated function for that particular shape. And this way, it's really easy to add new shapes without touching the rest of the infrastructure. And for a PBRT sphere in particular, we can thus extract the parsed parameters from the intermediate representation and create a normal Blender object from this, such as a UV sphere in this case. However, the astute among you probably recognizes though that this doesn't really import a sphere as much as it converts it into a mesh object. 
So that is something that I want to address next. Larger rendering frameworks, particularly educational ones, are often a, often a range supported types in hierarchies, typically using object-oriented programming, something like this. And we kind of want to do something similar. We want, we want to tell Blender that this specific object is actually a sphere with this and that property, whereas this other one is a cylinder with these other properties, etc. In some programming languages, such as Rust, shown here to the left, this is effectively captured in something that we call sum types, or simply enums. And we kind of want to do something similar for properties in Blender. And as far as I know, at least, there's no direct support for something like that. But it is relatively easy to fake it with a little bit of Python metaprogramming. First, though, we would start with creating a property class to represent the basis of this hierarchy, such as this one for the sphere. Then we would create another such property class to represent the entire hierarchy, which, is the, which in this case would include cameras, light sources, and any other objects we want to have. But most crucially, we have an enumeration of these different options, allowing us to differentiate between them and store various properties in each subtype. And this is where, where, this is where we get back to our imported sphere, by using some other kind of object as a proxy. We can see and manipulate that proxy instead, letting that contain various things, such as the transform and location in the scene, but also keep all unique properties about the sphere around as well. Thus, when we import the sphere, we still create a UV sphere mesh, but we also mark it as a kind of PBRT object or a PBRT sphere and add unique sphere properties to it, such as radius in this case. Of course, this is probably not ideal from a storage perspective, as this would effectively have to store everything about every kind of object, but seems to work okay in my prototype at least. Furthermore, with a little bit more metaprogramming, we can also do other things with this approach such as drawing different types of panel layouts for different types of proxy objects. We simply grab that type property first, then crawl over all of the properties for that subtype, which themselves can be found using this slightly weird double, unders double underscored annotations attribute. So in my prototype then, I used this technique to add a sidebar for adding and manipulating PBRT properties. In it, I can create new PBRT, PBRT objects with attributes already set, and also detect if the selected object is an active PBRT proxy, and then display or update those properties in this interface. Further, for regular Blender objects, there's also the option to convert them into a PBRT proxy. Unfortunately, though, I haven't really come up with a good mechanism for updating how the objects look in the UI just yet. For instance, if you change the sphere radius, the sphere unfortunately will not scale to match that new radius, but you could probably fix that with some kind of listener objects. But that is outside the scope of this talk, at least. And this same mechanism can also be used to add some kind of support for rendering properties. As I said before, this talk is mostly about importers and exporters, but as I mentioned before, the PBRT format is a combined scene and rendering format containing both of them. So we kind of need some kind of concept of it anyways. And thankfully, it is really straightforward to add new renderers to contain these particular properties. We only really need to create a class that derives from Blender's render engine type. Although in my case, I actually wanted to create three different ones, one for each version of PBRT that I intended to support. Thus, when each of those are registered, we get three new drop-down entries in our rendering menu, one for each version of them, 
even if, even if they won't actually do anything if you try to render with them. But they can now actually contain properties that we might care about. And that is the easy part, though. After that, you unfortunately need to create separate panels and property classes for each property that you want to control about these renderers. And here's an example for the so-called accelerator property in PBRT version 4, and an example panel that adapts to the various types this property could have, just as for the proxy objects I showed before. And for, unfortunately for me, though, there are still loads of these properties and panels, which were quite tedious to create, but should hopefully be done now, thanks to a couple of scripts that I created, barring any bugs, of course. So, that was all about proxies and render properties, which leaves us with the exporter, which arguably is one of the easier parts. And in fact, there are already a couple of PBRT exporters out there, although they are all probably due for a bit of an update, judging from the readme and currently advertised Blender version, but they probably still work actually. And that is no really a reason to harp on them. Just that they exist is a huge boon and makes for a good starting point for continuing this work, particular work, even if I am starting from scratch in my case. So what do we actually need to create an exporter then? Basically, we need exactly the same things that we need for the importer, an operator to do the export, and then optionally a panel and a menu entry. And the operator is very similar to our importer. The main difference is that instead of deriving from the import helper, we derive from the export helper, quite logically. After that, we still need to set. We need to create a set of configuration variables, add a draw method if we want to have a panel for it, and an execute method to actually drive the operator. For the configuration variables, they are very similar. We need to create the identifier to call the operator by using the ID name variable. And the main difference here is that we don't really need to care about multiple files this time. Once we start the export process, the actual file location that Blender wants us to populate can be found in the same file path property that I showed for the importer but we don't actually need to create that particular property actually, since that is actually handled by the inheritance hierarchy. Of course, we can still export to multiple files, but that is probably something that is more easily handled as in software instead. So you probably want to control that. The draw panel, again, works basically exactly the same. You either add it directly as a draw method in the operator class or create that separate class for it giving it the panel that you saw before and up here in the corner. And of course, we need to do, actually do something when we execute the export, which we handle by implementing the execute function. And here, you are simply given the file path, which you should then populate with your scene and rendering data. How you do it, however, is really entirely up to you. I happen to use to I happen to like to use regular print statements to do all this, so I typically redirect standard out and use regular print statements, but to each their own. As for actually printing out the various settings, here's a short example of how I did it. First, I simply extract the rendering properties, which of course may be slightly different depending on which version of PBRT you're using, so you need to extract the correct one. Then I call this to PBRT convenience method. And this method is this, which I suspect is a little bit hard to read from here. But in short, it uses the, it uses the same basic method that I use for the proxy and rendering objects, but this time to print out the property in the correct PBRT format. This, of course, means that we need to perform a bit of type and value translations to match what PBRT actually expects, but nothing really major needs to do here. And the main reason this is a method is to allow inheritance to specialize this particular thing, because a few properties, of course, have specialized corner cases that I need to support. 
And for the world objects themselves, there is, I hope, nothing really unexpected happening here. We simply traverse the list of seen objects and print out an appropriate representation for each of them. Which, for a single shape, looks something like this, which really is just print an attribute begin and end wrapper to avoid materials and transforms from affecting other objects, then print out the actual transform and material for that object, and then check if the object is marked as a proxy, and if that's the case, handle it specially and print out that object in the same kind of representation as for the rendering property. Otherwise, find some kind of way of converting the Blender object to something that PBRT can recognize, such as meshes, etc. Otherwise, issue a warning, simply. And that is pretty much everything that I have to talk about exporters. The last thing I want to bring up is something that I haven't really found a good way of solving, namely spectral properties. In short, RGB colors that we typically use is just a very efficient hack to represent material properties. But they have some real limitations when it comes to representing things in a physically correct way. In, in reality, how light actually interacts with materials can differ a lot depending on what part of the spectrum the light actually contains. So right now, I'm simply doing a lossy conversion to RGB for everything since I couldn't really find a practical way of working with spectral color data in Blender. Obviously, I could simply keep the original spectra around somewhere for the PBRT objects, but that would kind of make them impractical to work with. So I figured that it kind of would be nice as some kind of UE widget for spectra like this, similar to kind of curves that we have in Blender, allowing us to pick from some kind of presets among metals or lights and then allow us to modify the response curve accordingly. But that is really just me musing on what would be nice for working with spectral properties in Blender, not an actual suggestion given the complexity of adding support for something like that. Which brings me to the end of this talk. And just to quickly summarize things, during this presentation I've talked about, I have talked about PBRT what it is and what kind of renderings it can do along with its file format and briefly shown how to create custom importers and exporters for Blender using PBRT as an example as well as how to add rendering, rendering property to influence these, these importers and exporters and how to use proxy objects in Blender to represent various types of PBRT objects. And with that, I think it's about time to conclude the presentation and I guess open up for any kind of questions if you have any and, of course, hopefully some answers. I got a, the question was about, uh, to summarize the question, it was about how available is the Python API for creating these kind of custom widgets. And I dug a little bit into this actually before this talk because the, I thought the question might actually pop up. And unfortunately, it's very hard to add currently. Uh, from what I've seen before, if you want to add curves, you could probably add a curve uh, widget into it. But in order to get that, you actually have to hack into a node object to actually contain uh, the, the curve itself, because you can't create one of those because it's a C++ object, uh, making it really hard to create them in custom locations, at least as, as far as I was able to understand from it. And the same goes for color ramps and other stuff like that. And extending this further, of course, to something like a spectral widget uh, would be even harder, of course. Of course, I am not a developer uh, for Blender, so I could be wrong, but the developer 
issue that I found uh, for this uh, particular issue uh, was from 2002 uh, and hadn't been updated since then. So I'm not sure how interested this is. As I said before, they do exist, but in those cases, you typically create a node uh, that you can work with to contain the spectra, uh, the uh, curve uh, widget, which you can then try to hack into. But as I said before, that's because the node contains the C++ object, and that's why you can kind of use it as a go-to thing. So it can be hacked? It can be hacked, but it's not currently officially supported, has been my understanding. The importer does handle rendering settings, uh, depending on which PBRT, uh, sorry. The question is, does the importer handle the rendering settings in any way? And in this case, I haven't really added support for it, but of course, depending on which actual renderer you have selected in your menu, you might actually want to use that to influence what you actually import. Uh, and of course, currently, I actually have that in a separate panel to just select which version of PBRT you want to treat that file as, but of course it's quite simple to just check the rendering property first and populate it that first as well. That is basically a one-liner, I believe. And, and you can actually uh, render in Blender? Ah, actually rendering in Blender is a very different topic, unfortunately. As I said before, all of the rendering classes are actually entirely empty. They only contain uh, basically the properties themselves, so that, such that I can refer to them. Uh, actually hacking into the rendering part becomes a bit problematic, since now you're actually going to have to think about how you distribute PB, the PBRT binaries somehow, which I've, I haven't really gone into just yet. I've tried to do it locally on my machine, and it kind of works, but uh, that's as far as I've gotten so far. You would need to handle it properly to make sure that you can go to a Mac machine, have it work, have a Linux version to someone else, and also Windows probably. And that is more than I could handle here. In addition to previous question, I'm just very new to this topic, so that's why it makes sense to do. So if it's not rendering in Blender, then like why may someone need to import PBRT files to Blender? Like what user can do? The main thing, the question is why would you really want to import some existing scenes into Blender? There are a couple of reasons. One very silly example is maybe you want to compare an existing scene that someone created in only PBRT to, for instance, Cycles, which is exactly what I did before with that uh, scene uh, with a bumpy glass. That is one reason. Uh, but typically, you want to have some kind of backwards compatibility because PBRT has existed for a couple of decades now and they have hosted loads of scenes for that particular format. So being able to bring all of those scenes into Blender and just to do s simple things sort of adjusting where the camera is, what kind of camera parameters you are, could be really nice just from a usability point of view. Exactly. That's the primary idea behind this, really. Having a really nice interface for really creating new PBRT files. Looks like that's all the questions we're getting. So, before I end, you will be able to find all materials that I created for this work or related to this along some of these links on my homepage. And of course, if you have any more questions about PBRT or even GLTF, Vulcan ray tracing or micromaps that I talked about last year, feel free to, stop, feel free to contact me on any of these emails or just chat me up during the conference now. Thank you.